Hi, I'm Allison Bell, Executive Director of the Heritage Society. Welcome to our monthly lecture series. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Ray Bryant. She is with the Houston Suffragist Project, sponsored by the Houston Genealogical Forum. Mm -hmm. Ray is also a former president of the Houston Genealogical Forum, and she is here today to share what the team of five uncovered during their extensive research, and you won't want to miss it. Welcome, Ray. Yes. I'm just going to give you a moment to talk about the Houston Suffragist Project. We were five women last fall. We knew this was going to be an exciting year with the uh, 19th Amendment uh, centennial, and we said, hey, what happened in Houston? So our plan was to find the names of women suffragists in Houston after the 19th Amendment was certified and focus on them and put them up on our website. We had no idea we were going to fall into a rabbit hole and find out that this is a unique story not only for Houston and Texas, we believe for the entire United States. So we hope you enjoy it and thank you Allison. Thank you. Hi everybody. I am very glad you're here too. There's a lot of interest about this story and this exhibit. It has a many unique items. It's putting to it together the suffrage movement in Houston in a fresh way that I think we're the only city in the United States that is looking at this way at the suffrage. And in particular, we have something very special. We have a court case, 91196, where the suffragists went to court up to the day before the election in order to be able to vote for free. And that's what I'm gonna be speaking to you about today. Now, like any great epic journey, you already know the spo spoiler, you know what happens, but the journey gives us the depth, the understanding, and the reasons why the individuals who were involved and the forces that influenced them came about. So this is Hortense Ward's gambit to break the Texas poll tax laws in 1920. Now, this story's only been uncovered in the last few months through research with the Houston Suffragist Project. We had no idea what we were gonna find and we fell into a rabbit hole. And uh, we have been piecing it together the parts are still unfolding. This is the first time it's ever been presented in any way, so you're gonna to have to be patient as we walk through it. And also, put yourself into a different frame of mind. Because if we look at this from our eyes of 2020 through the lens of time, Houston was a very different place 100 years ago. It was segregated, there were laws, there were social customs, that kept people apart, and there were also customs and laws that kept women restricted in their public life. So I'm asking you to think about this like a play. And I'm going to briefly describe some of the influences and the individuals who were involved in it. The women's organizations we usually think of suffrage as being specifically designed for that activity, but women's groups were organized in a different way than today. The white women's groups, and there were hundreds of different women's groups, many of them were organized under the umbrella of the, women's Federa the Federation of Women's Clubs, and they acted as this umbrella for others. So whatever issues that might attract a number of different groups, uh, they could use their leadership across these different organizations and they would come on board to work together. And this way they could mobilize not only dozens, but hundreds, but thousands of women. The African American women were also organized in much the same way. And their uh, founding organization the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which was formed in 1896, as an outgrowth of being pushed out or shunted to the side of the National White Women's Suffrage Organization. But they operated within the African American women's community much the same way. So if you see a group that is the Married Women's Society 
in the African American community, of which there was one here in Houston that was founded by many leading Houstonians, um, you can be assured that they were tapped in to work for the suffrage. Just because they aren't called suffrage doesn't mean that they weren't activists. And for the activists here in Houston and Harris County, education and health were two of their largest issues. That's another reason why we have to look through the lens of time, because like today with COVID-19, where we have a pandemic and we have shutdowns, the women between 1917, 1918, and 1920 were facing the same issues. Only they had TB and they had the Spanish flu. So healthcare was very important, their children, and also education. On the men's side, there are some heroes to this story because women can't accomplish anything without the assistance of influential men because this is a world where women could, women could not vote. Women had only recently, since 1913, and Hortense was part of that in Texas with the Married Women's Law, able to start their own businesses and enter into contracts. So this was a world after World War I that was opening up for women, and a lot of young women were moving into stenographer jobs, which we would call secretaries or administrative assistants. But on the men's side, aside from the men who were supporting the women in enfranchisement, there were large interests in Texas against women voting. And there were three major groups. The first group were the alcohol. There was a big anti-suffragist, they poured millions of dollars into all kinds of disinformation about women and alcohol because they were afraid of prohibition. The second group were the cotton interests. And this was one of the major industries 100 years ago in Texas and also Houston had, surprisingly, manufacturing and textile, um, where many women worked, and also children, which was another suffragist issue. Children's labor, wages, safety, and even things like bathrooms, where women could change and have hygiene, and they worked long hours, 12, 13 hours a day. So the cotton interests were against women voting, and also the alcohol. Now there's a third group, because surprisingly to us today, immigrant men, because only men could vote, were allowed to vote in Texas. If you were, had lived in Texas for one year and had residence in your county for six months, you could fill out a piece of paper saying you had an intention of becoming a citizen and you could vote if you paid your poll tax. So there, these are the three groups. And the immigrant group, for the most part, were very pro-alcohol. They probably came from Europe, that's where the majority of the immigrants were from, and they had a culture of drinking, and also many Southern men enjoyed their drinking, and they certainly didn't want to see the prohibition go into effect. In 1917, that's why I have to take you back to this, because we have these influences um, the governor is James Ferguson, and he is supported by those three main groups. He has a coalition, mostly rural and business interests, and he is definitely against women voting. He doesn't like intellectuals, and he particularly has it out for the University of Texas. He thinks they're too liberal, he thinks they're bringing in too many ideas, and he starts to go after U of T. He wants a line I veto, and he starts cutting the funds. Now, the suffragist women are very much in favor of education. They mobilize against this, and with other groups, Ferguson is tried for his abuses, and he's impeached. And this provides an opening and an opportunity for our group of heroines. The lieutenant governor is William P. Hobby. He wasn't born in Houston, but he grew up in Houston. He has other roots here. He has business interests in, in journalism, in the press. And he has, he's a young guy, and he has aspirations, political aspirations. This is the beginning of his career. He also sees this as an opportunity. 
Um, Minnie Fisher Cunningham, who is in Galveston, she's the president of TESA, which is the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. She travels with other prominent suffragists and even Hortense Ward makes several trips to Austin and they cut a deal. And here's the deal. If Hobby supports women being able to vote in their primaries, and unfortunately this is only gonna apply to white women, then they are gonna put their weight behind him. He's to fill out Ferguson's term and then when he runs again, if the women can vote for him in the Democratic primary, then he will be on the ballot as the candidate and Texas is a pretty much a one party state. He will become governor. Not all Democrats agree with his view. As I said, it's a one party state, but he sees this as the way of the future. He sees getting a very important constituency and he agrees. Now, the other big part of this is, oh, I, this is a photo that you can see behind me. Uh, it has not been seen publicly. It is available online with the Houston Chronicle. There is the famous picture of Hortense Ward, the stage picture, but this is the actual picture of her signing with her friends standing around her. And I have to say, this is my favorite because it shows this movement is all about working together. This movement is not about individuals. This can only happen with the pushing of thousands and tens of thousands of people with common interest in mind. Texas is also unique in another way, which is an obstacle to change. Unlike other states where the legislatures pass bills, Texas has the definition of who can vote in their constitution. So any change to the constitution has to go through a general election. It was set up this way in 1876 and 1877 at the end of Reconstruction, so the ranching and the different business interests could still control what was going on in Austin. It's a high hurdle in order to pass a general election ballot. This is a big disadvantage for women because overall, the men in Texas, and we have to consider the whole Texas, not just the urban area men, are pretty much against women voting. They don't want, they don't want prohibition, they don't want changes, they want to keep things the way they are. But the state legislature could change that women could vote in primaries. And the reason is a primary is not an election of governance. You're just voting who's going to go on the ballot. If you vote in a general election, you're deciding who's going to actually occupy the office. And on general election ballots, you are deciding issues of governance, as I said before, about bond issues, funding, and government priorities. So this was a side door for women to start to vote. And that happened the first time in the beginning in the summer of 1918. Hortense Ward, Hortense, she traveled the state. She wrote editorials. She published a pamphlet that was widely distributed and hundreds of thousands of women voted that summer of 1918. A year later, in the summer of 1919, a couple other things happened. In June, on June 4th, there was a general election. Hobby was able to get on the ballot the issue of women's suffrage. So the definition in the Constitution was very clear. In order to vote, you had to be a man, you had to be over 21, you had to pay a poll tax and you had to live in your county at least six months. The word woman or female was not mentioned. The urban areas, Dallas, Houston, passed it, but it failed throughout the whole state. Two weeks later though, the Texas legislature ratified on June 24th, the 19th Amendment. There was already a wave happening um, with the 19th Amendment. Momentum was building. Texas was the first Southern state to ratify. Arkansas was the second, which happened maybe about a week later. But in this way, Texas legislators were being forward thinking and they were seeing the handwriting on the wall. 
this was going to happen and they needed to get on board. There was this giant wave. We know in the summer of 1920, in August, there's the dramatic story of what happened in Tennessee. On August 18th, Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify, and on August 26th, it went into effect. Now, it's an entirely different game in Texas. This slide shows the actual 19th Amendment. It is very clear. I'm going to read just a part of it. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state. Now, abridged is an old term that means to be diminished or curtailed. It's very clear that the issue of paying the poll tax is not consistent with the language of the 19th Amendment. So what's going to happen? It's not like this was going to be any surprise. There had already been a lot of discussion and the State Attorney General, Mr. Kirtan, had already been putting out opinions that he believed, given the circumstances, that Texas was going to have to let women vote and vote for free because they were not to abridge or deny. Other legal opinions concurred, including the governor, Hobby. He wanted women to vote for free. Now in 1918, when women voted, they did vote for free. But part of the law was they only got to vote for free in 1918. And after that, they did have to pay the poll tax. So beginning in October of 1918, they started paying the poll tax. Now, this is a little not complicated, but you have to understand the structure of how it was set up because it was definitely obstructionist. And as we know, when you have obstruction, the details are the ways that they trip people up. So originally only property owners could pay the poll tax and vote. It's a very old white guy thing. So the way it was structured beginning in October of the end of the year through January 31st of the following year was the window to pay for the following year's elections. You got one receipt, you paid your money, you got a receipt, and no matter how many times there was an election, you just brought that receipt and you could vote. So women started paying their poll tax in October of 1918. They paid the poll tax from 1918 into January 1919 and some of them began paying in October of 1919 into 19 January of 1920 and able to enabled them to vote in any of the 1920 elections so they were already getting used to voting they were already part of the process and that was the whole idea and the strategy by allowing women to vote in the primaries but remember, the legislature was moving forward on ratification, but the electorate was not there. And now the legislators were between a rock and a hard place. In June of 1919, the men of Texas said, no suffrage. Now the federal government is saying, suffrage. What are they going to do? So Governor Hobby, he calls a special session in September of 1920 and a lot of guys don't show up so he calls a second one he's trying to get a quorum he's got a big problem there's an election in two months he wants women to vote for free but he's got to have the legislature do something so they do finally get together and September 20th 21st 22nd and they come up with a plan because there's a lot of interest in this state, I was talking about those individuals before, they were terrified to have all these hundreds of thousands of women vote for free. It looked like it was going to be mayhem, and that was the concern by some people. They didn't want more people to be franchised, they wanted fewer people to be enfranchised. 
Now the poll tax in 1920 was a dollar fifty. That doesn't sound like very much, but if we do the inflation calculator, that's between twenty-five. It's around twenty-five dollars, and that may not sound very much. But if you're a couple, even today, would you spend fifty dollars to vote? Would you even spend twenty-five dollars to vote? And you have to remember, in 1920, there were individuals, particularly women who might be working as laundresses, in shops, in factories, they're making a dollar a day. And they have no way to go and pay that poll tax at the county uh, tax collector's office Monday through Friday, eight to five. So that was another way for voter suppression. Now today, we mostly think of voter suppression with the African-American vote. There's a lot in the media about that but it also affected a lot of other people. It affected all poor people, and it also affected rural people. So it was just difficult to get into town, it was limited time, and it was a way to keep people away from the polls. The women in Houston were pretty smart. They knew that there was difficulty in getting downtown to, to pay your poll tax, so they asked, if they could be deputized and start to set up tables in public places at different events. They started this in the fall of 1919. And we're fortunate that we have a photo of this that was in the Houston Chronicle. It's been cleaned up because it was very poor quality, but you're able to see an actual photo in 1919 of women paying the poll tax, even the dollar bill that's being exchanged. It's very exciting that we do have this small piece of our suffrage history. The plan that the state legislature came up was threefold. They wanted to keep the poll tax in place, but they still had to open that creep, open that door a little bit to allow anybody else to vote. So, this is what was suggested and passed. That first of all, that they would use the 1919 poll tax list, the 1920 poll tax list, and they would give a two week window in October, which ended on October 21st, for anyone, a man or a woman, to pay the poll tax. That window opened, and to the anti-suffragist delight, not very many women showed up. The suffragists were astounded. Hey, why aren't you paying? So they started having tables in grocery stores. They started having tables in department stores. And they were begging people. They were begging everyone, please pay your poll tax. When that window closed on October 21st, maybe another thousand women voted. I mean, had paid their poll tax. So we had a good turnout but it wasn't the tens of thousands that Hortense wanted. She thought there might be 40,000 women who would pay. She wanted just to swamp the 1920 election, but it didn't look like it was gonna happen. Now, if you remember, I spoke about the Attorney General's opinion that women should be able to vote for free, and that was only a couple months earlier, and the same thing with the governor. There were a lot of women who apparently thought that was still going to happen, but that window was closing. So again, we have to call in our heroine, Hortense. We're going to call 911, and she had a plan. She was going to pull it out. She talked to a friend of hers, Mary Hinckley, Mary F. Hinckley, who is an independent businesswoman. She's a realtor. That is a new field, a new occupation for women. Today we think of realtors as being primarily, especially residential, a women's occupation. But at that time, women were not hired for that. It was only men. And she had to have her own business because nobody would even hire her. She was so well known in Houston, they just called her Mrs. Hinckley. She was the plaintiff. And they had what was called a sympathetic um, defendant. She had a suffragist friend, Cora Lay, whose husband said, yeah, I want women to vote. You can sue me. I, I run the ballot box in, in my neighborhood in Woodland Heights. 
And the way things are now, if you don't show up with that piece of paper and your receipt, I'm going to have to tell you there's the door. So they went to court. They also had to have a judge that they really respected and they knew his opinion. And that is a very important part of this next issue. We have Judge Harvey. Judge Harvey has been publicly writing about his support for women to be able to vote for truth. He is also the judge for the 80th District Court, which covers both Harris County and Waller County. He spends part of his time in Waller County, in Hempstead, and part of the time at the courthouse in downtown Houston. He agrees on October 23rd, two days after that extra window closed, to hear the case. It was very short because in the afternoon newspapers, he has a blasted bomb that blows up all the plans by the state legislature. Women can vote for free. This is covered by newspapers all over the state. There's a lot of interest. Other judges, other communities are looking for the leadership in Harris County and in Houston. It looks like everything's going to go to Hortense's plan and the women who were kind of sitting on the fence knowing that probably the courts were going to support them, they're excited too. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Now this is only nine days. This is the 23rd of October before the November 2nd election. It looks like they did it. But of course, we know there are other forces at work. And Puritan gets pressure in Austin, and he puts out a ruling that only this Judge Harvey's ruling, his opinion that Judge Harvey's ruling, applies to Harris and Waller counties. And if other judges across the state want to fall in line, they're going to have to have their other rulings, similar rulings. But nobody does. So it starts to come down to look like only Houston is going to be the big heavyweight in the state where women can vote for free. Not everybody is happy about this. And three people who are particularly unhappy are the county judge, Chester Bryan, the county attorney, uh, the county sheriff, Benson, and the tax collector, Townsend. They appoint themselves as the election board, they call themselves, and they secretly start to pass around a letter to all the poll workers, who are men, because obviously only men had been voting, they were running the polls, saying, we are not going to recognize the ruling from Judge Harvey. Days pass, and this letter gets leaked a few days before the election. And Hortense is incensed. The Chronicle says there's going to be fireworks. And she's threatening to take them to court. She's threatening to get an injunction. She's threatening them with interfering in a federal election. And she's going to take it all the way to the feds. So now, there's going to be a second hearing. It's going to be on November 1st, the day before the election. However, the women, remember all those groups of women I was talking about that are organized? They're not sitting still. Over the weekend, they have their own resolution. They're collecting hundreds. We have no idea. Unfortunately, we don't have, their resol we don't have any copy of their petitions. But we know at the morning of November 1st, instead of just Mary Hinckley, there are 13 plaintiffs, including men. Husbands are stepping up. There are 12 or women's organizations represented, teachers groups, mom groups, the Houston, the Houston Pen women, these are the journalists. We have over 30 journalists that are involved in, in the suffrage movement. We have all kinds of other groups and they present their petition to Judge Harvey. It doesn't take him very long. Within a very short time, even that morning, he's giving a, a public um, press conference, you might call it, and he's explaining why he is saying that women can vote for free, 
and he has three reasons. The first reason is the state constitution says that you have to pay your poll tax in the year that you vote. Women did not know in January, and they had to pay by January 31st, when the 19th Amendment was ratified and certified, that they were going to be able to vote in January. Those women didn't have an opportunity to pay. You can't charge a tax for something retroactively. The second thing is, the state constitution, the Texas Constitution, says that you have to pay each year. Judge Harvey ruled you can't use the 1919 poll tax for a 1920 election. It violates the state constitution. And the third thing he says is only the constitution gives the definition of who can vote. It has to go through a general election. And remember, the men voted against it. So for the state legislature to come up and cook up their compromise is not valid because the constitution overrides any legislation. He also said if there's any election officials that turn away an otherwise qualified woman, he was going to hold them in contempt. Even at the same time that Judge Harvey is having his press conference, Chester Bryan is having another press conference and he is instructing publicly poll workers to turn away women. Even after he knows the ruling, he's not going to let it go. We're fortunate that we have the original court documents. They're available at the archives for the district court, and the archivist there has located them. They're in, they're in perfect condition, I mean, they're in poor condition, and we need help to have them archived and preserved. But you can see a picture of them. They've been water damaged because the roof leaked, and this is an important part of our suffragist history. We have the words of the women that day. We have the words that were signed by hundreds of women that were represented by at least a dozen clubs. And their words speak to us through time because they resonate in our own time. I'm going to end with reading you those words, but I have two other things to say. I'm talking to you about the court case, but you don't know what happened tomorrow. And there's another part of the story in this play, that's the next act, because at this point in time, it was all a confusion. Who's gonna show up? What's gonna happen? How are the women gonna respond? nobody knew. All eyes were on Harris County and in Houston in particular. You'll have to come down to the exhibit and see. <laughs> and the other part of it is there's something special in the exhibit. We have a 15 foot long banner. It has around 3,600 names. Do you remember that poll tax list, the supplemental one where they combine the 19 and 19 and 1920 list in the window? It survived. The original did not survive, but images of it did. The microfilm, I don't know if it survived, but uh, the Houston Suffragist Project took that whole list, which was 22,000 names, and they extracted out the women's names. All these women's names are on the wall. You can come and see the grandmothers, the great-grandmothers, the aunties, and the, and the great-great-grandmothers who stood strong and were part of this important civil rights experience in Texas, and in Houston in particular, that's been obscured to us until now. You can find their names. You will see many names of families you recognize that have had very important parts of Houston history. You can see women who are older that have been working for decades for suffrage. You can see young women's names who go on to play very important roles. Uh, 
these women, looking at them closer, we see how they shaped Houston and how moving into a larger space in the community gave them more power. And it has helped us today to have a community and the lives that we expect with education, with healthcare, the whole industries, the standards are dependent on the work of these women. Thousands of these women were young teachers. They wanted better schools, they wanted better curriculum. In fact, they established the curriculum. There was no curriculum until the suffragists women got involved. And healthcare, the TB clinics, hospitals, even Jefferson Davis Hospital started as the result of the effort of the suffragists and allies. So you can see their invisible hand and in how it has affected us today. Please come, even if you don't have an ancestor with Houston, you can enjoy and share this moment because they are telling you what you need to do today and what we are facing this November that they faced 100 years ago. This is the Houston Suffragist Resolution. Whereas it has been called to our attention that there is an effort on the part of certain county officials purporting to act as election board to prevent women from voting in the coming election, thereby defeating the purpose of the 19th Amendment. And whereas we have worked too hard for many years to secure this right to be deprived of the ballot by an attempted illegal act. Now, therefore, we call to the attention of the women of Harris County and the state of Texas the fact they have the legal right to vote without the payment of a poll tax guaranteed under the 19th Amendment. And we urge them to go to the polls on November 2nd and vote for the principles and institutions that will ensure a clean, fair, honest, and efficient government in the county, state, and nation and we especially urge them to vote for the school amendment and raise Texas from the 39th in educational standing to the place it should rightfully occupy and give a square deal to the children in rural schools. Hi. You were left with a cliffhanger. November 1st, 1920. Judge Harvey has just ruled that if any man turns away an otherwise qualified woman from voting the next day, they're going to be held in contempt. At the same time, County Judge Chester Bryan is telling the poll workers, ignore Judge Harvey. Who's going to win? Nobody knows. The next morning, polls open at 8 o'clock. We don't have the benefit of any of the writings of these individuals. We have to rely entirely on newspaper accounts of how the days unfolded. Fortunately, there are three newspapers, so we can get various points of view. But what we know is, even by 8 o'clock, at some of the precincts, there are over 100 women in line. African-American women had been mobilizing too. We know for the resolutions over the weekend on the October 30th and 31st, the white women were moving throughout their community getting signatures so they could give them to Judge Harvey. But this is a segregated time, remember? The black women are operating in parallel, but invisible. But this is their time to emerge because they are ready to go. On the 31st, they were in the churches. That was one of the main ways they organized. The Black and Tan Party, which you can read about in the exhibit that's online through the virtual tour, so you're familiar with it, had a representative at each one of the black churches in Houston. They had sample ballots. They showed women how to vote. Now today, when we look at a ballot, even if you had a paper one, we have the concept that you mark the people you want to vote for. 
in that time, you marked out the people you didn't want, and it was called scratching. So it turns out that the particular ballot, and unfortunately we haven't located a copy yet, but there are descriptions of it, had six columns. It was the size of a newspaper. There were six slates, and you were to cross down, in other words, scratch out all of the different people you didn't want as the candidate that you were voting for. So the only unmarked areas would be that's who you're voting for. And so there were schools, and that's what the African-American women wanted to be trained. They were voting straight ticket. Well, the majority of them were voting straight ticket, black and tan. Over half of the precincts, the ballot boxes, did not have enough poll workers. The men decided if they couldn't turn away women, they weren't going to play this game. They just weren't going to show up. And they used the very lame excuse that they weren't being paid enough because of the expected volume. It's almost as if we didn't win, we can't lose with any kind of grace, so we're not going to show up. We still want to throw the election, even during election day. Again, our heroines, they step up, they volunteer, they go to the polling places, and they sit at the tables, they assist the voters, and women are running the election. They are going to end up collecting the ballots, securing the ballots, and tallying the ballots, not only in that day, but in the days to come. Hortense Ward, for her part, was expecting trouble. She didn't know how many outlying areas were going to have uh, precinct captains who would continue to turn away women. So she used the newspapers, the morning papers, to alert anyone that if they knew of any irregularities, she was going to call her and she would send representatives out and she was in hourly contact with Judge Harvey. She wanted no 12th hour shenanigans on the part of the election board. The lines continued all day. This part of the story is very moving, and particularly since we have to remember that we are living in Jim Crow South, and this is a time for African American women to vote for the first time and also vote for free. On our list, the poll tax list, we have hundreds of women who are African American, but we know thousands voted. And from the newspaper accounts, they were brought to the polls, and they came in large groups of 25, 50, 100, and their men surrounded them and stood in line with them for hours. Women brought their babies. If you're going to stand in line with a baby for hours and you're nursing, there are women we know who voted who are on the poll tax who were born in bondage. And this was their moment that they were going to be able to vote. It's a stunning achievement. Now when we first started researching this and finding this out, we didn't understand the results. Today when we find out the results of elections, it's usually within the, that day or the next day. We know in 1916, the prior presidential election, 13,000 men voted, because only men could vote in 1916. We were seeing those kind of figures when we were looking at the newspapers on November 3rd. But the numbers keep climbing. The, the ballot results are being just dribbled out. Because partially, from our perspective today, we think that the election board didn't want people to know how many women actually voted. It took almost a week before the election to be certified. We know that the polling boxes were the, in the African American precincts that probably five to 6,000 women voted, black women. We know from Judge Townsend, who is an avowed person 
publicly stating he does not want Negro women to vote, that there were likely another thousand women standing in line when the polls closed at seven. Remember, these are women who are working women. They're working in factories. They're working 11 hour days. They have to go home, feed their families, go stand in line. There wasn't time to vote. For them to make the commitment to be there in line speaks volumes about how important this opportunity was to them. At the end, we estimate, even though we don't know the exact numbers, that there were approximately 30,000 people who tried to vote. The total election figures are around 28,000. So from 1916, when 13,000 men voted to go to almost 30,000, we have to assume the large majority of the difference are women voters. To give you a perspective, in Georgia, only one woman qualified to vote in the entire state. She paid a poll tax, and they didn't offer an extra window. To have this many women voting is an incredible civil rights accomplishment for women and for African Americans. It also speaks to us today because we know, again, we are in another pandemic. We know the hardships. We know that there's efforts to suppress the vote. For women to go and stand in line for hours tells us this was very meaningful to them. The following year, in 1921, by the spring, the state constitution was changed. Women were added, so now they had to pay the poll tax. The poll tax stayed in place until 1964 when the 24th Amendment was passed. And Texas maintained their poll taxes on local and state elections until 1966. That means this one election for women between 1920 and 1966, 46 years have to pass before women can again vote for free. We have an obligation to recognize their accomplishment and to remember it because they are our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, and our aunts. Their courage should be the courage we take today because we don't have to stand in line with men surrounding us because we're afraid of violence. In Florida, there was violence, and an African-American community was burned down because one of their individuals tried to vote. I hope you've enjoyed the story. I would suggest you come to the exhibit or take the virtual tour so you can see the banner with 3,600 names of these courageous women. And even if they're not your grandmothers, they are all of our grandmothers. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for sharing those untold stories. And I want to thank Ray and the team mm -hmm. and your Yes, team. and I want to give a special shout out to the Houston Suffragist Project, the five primary people involved with the research. We have Monica Anderson. We have Jenny Douglas, Mary Hollis, and Barbara Richards. To do the extracting from the list of 22,000 names, there were three additional volunteers, Randy Pace, Linda Collins, and Carolyn Schimmick. Uh, Monica Anderson is currently Program Director for the Houston Genealogical Forum. Barbara Richards is President, and Jenny Douglas is a former President. Linda Collins is currently president of the Clayton Library Friends. Without all this teamwork, just like those women 100 years ago, we wouldn't be able to know what we found today. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you to everyone. And stay tuned now for our live Q&A on Zoom. <laughs>